There could be no more appropriate venue for the launch of a nurse in the Duff and splits um, uh, the memoirs of Emma Duffin, whose diaries form part of a very significant Duffin archive here in the public record office D2109. Um, it includes the five uh, diaries in which Emma Duffin, as Emma referred to, uh, recorded her First World War experiences, and one further diary recording her time in Belfast during World War II. Moreover, this is a book that is so good it's been launched twice. Um, once, uh, initially, in the home of its publishers, to whom I'm very grateful, the uh, Northern Ireland War Memorial, last month to commemorate the first raid on Belfast on the 7th of April. Uh, and now here in Pronai, where it's equally appropriate, as I said, because the huge Duffin archive here is one of its, well, my view, ju jewels in the crown. When World War II broke out in September 1939, Emma Duffin resumed keeping a diary, the one that is being published here. It serves as a reliable and descriptive first-hand account of the aerial bombardments on Belfast by the Luftwaffe in April and May 1941, whose 75th anniversary we are now commemorating. And can I just say that in the midst of the current attention, uh, understandably being devoted to the centenaries of 2016, the Easter Rising and the Song, it's entirely appropriate that thanks to the publishers, the War Memorial, and, and here also in the record office, that the site of this significant event, the 75th anniversary of the Blitz, is not being lost. When Emma Duffin accepted the position of Commandant of the Voluntary Aid Detachment uh, Unit at Strombinus Military Hospital in March 1940, she was in her 58th uh, year. She had already begun keeping a diary uh, as soon as the war broke out in September 1939. At that time she had noted, Quotes. During the 1914-18 war, I kept a diary, and though it was not written from day to day, it was written while the events were uh, fresh in my mind, and may someday be of interest. It is uh, unlikely that in this war I will be able to take any active part, but having served as a VAD in a military hospital during the last war, I have, as we have all been asked to do, uh, registered again for nursing service as a first aid, uh, at a first aid post. Being 25 years older, um, it would only, I would only be able to do for short spells. Uh, and this account of her diary will probably be less, in, on this account, my diary will probably be less interesting. And I may bait decide later that it is not worth keeping. But I will begin by recording some of our impressions before and on the outbreak of war. That's her in 1912, handsome girl. She had just at that stage come back from Germany as an au pair before joining up in 1915. And then that slightly more forbidding image in 1940 uh, was attached to what obviously her in uniform of the Commandant and inserted in the first page of the diary. The diaries Emma referred to that she had kept during the First World War when she had served as a voluntary aid detachment nurse in Egypt and then in France from 1916 to the end of the war in Le Havre and Calais in northern France were published in 2014. Uh, where they were uh, uh, and uh, launched here in Pruneye, where they have been deposited uh, since the death of Miss Duffin in 1979. It is perhaps worth noting at this juncture that on the flyleaf of the first diary is a notation, uh, not that diary, the diary of the First World War. Um, uh, the, the, she says, these are diaries written by M.S. Duffin during the 1914-18 war at the request of the Deputy Keeper of the Records, uh, Mr. Kenneth Darwin, I would like these deposited in the Northern Ireland Record Office after my death, Emma S. Duffin. It might also be worth drawing a, a comparison between her earlier diaries in the First World War uh, and those she kept in the 1940s. Her record of her time in France is in effect memoirs, not least because by the very nature of her sometimes interminable stints on duty, um, she could only write them up uh, later. Uh, uh, she rewrite her experiences uh, when she was demobbed. Her Belfast diary is altogether different. It was written up more regularly and has the added value of recording the experiences of civilians under fire, as it were. The First World War, although it affected practically every family in Britain and Ireland, was fought over there. Um, and apart from Zeppelin raids, principally on London and some coastal English, to English towns, the civilians at home remained relatively unscathed. The Second World War, perhaps for the first time in modern warfare, brought war on, a, on an industrial scale to the population's doorstep, mostly in the form of aerial bombing raids. And Emma's diary serves as a first-hand record of how the city and people of Belfast were affected. 
uh, by their own bombardments and how they responded. In the First World War, Emma Duffin, sir, born in Belfast in 1883, had enlisted at the age of 31 as a voluntary detachment nurse. Uh, there was a point, uh, there was a joint um, St John Ambulance and Red Cross initiative established, that is the, uh, uh, the voluntary detachment initiative was established in 1909, which organised volunteers to help the war effort, principally in a medical or nursing capacity. It was because of this experience that Emma had been approached in 1940 to ask would she act as a VAD commandant at the Stranmillis Military Hospital uh, on the site of Stranmillis Training College. The students had been evacuated, the students at Stranmillis Training College had been evacuated in 1940 to Fawcett's Hotel in Fort Rush. Uh, not as palatial a relocation as it might have seemed, there being no heating in the building and Port Rush in midwinter being Port Rush in midwinter. <laughs> She had been called up in September 1915, reported uh, uh, in London, and was uh, sent by boat to Alexandria in Egypt, where she spent the next six months uh, in the wards, tending to casualties evacuated from Gallipoli. Um, until, uh, then, uh, until then, the most uh, concentrated military uh, engagement encountered by the British Army. On her return from Egypt, uh, she re-enlisted, and uh, from 19, April 1916, uh, she was sent to number two general hospital in Le Havre and uh, then later in Calais, where until the end of the war, <coughs> nursed the wounded, uh, Allied and German soldiers, as they were as they were stretched in, uh, uh, straight from the trenches in the Western Front. That's her in her VAD uniform. That's her war service, which at the very bottom you can see honours awarded. She was mentioned in dispatches, as many were at the end of the war, almost people who had been overlooked for their dedication. Um, she also took with her to Egypt uh, a photograph, uh, a camera, which she, in real life, as it were, she was a book illustrator and, and card illustrator. So she had an artistic eye, and so she enjoyed taking photographs. These are unusual in the sense that they, they were, as it were, photographs of active service. And secondly, <coughs> it's unusual to find interior hospital war photographs during the First World War. And then in that, the earlier ones were in Egypt and these are now in France in the Alp. And because she could speak German, she struck up a friendship. Uh, with some German soldiers, sometimes to the detriment of her own reputation in the hospital because this was seen as sort of slightly going native, um, and that was one. Uh, the people she, the soldiers, German and otherwise uh, British soldiers, whom she tended in Le Havre uh, were very seriously, they were too seriously ill or wounded to be put on ships and taken to Southampton. So by and large, uh, the majority of them died, as did uh, the one she called the Little Hun. Following her demobilization in 1919, and after having been mentioned in dispatches, as you saw there, uh, on her return to Belfast, Emma continued the family involvement in charitable activities. Her mother, Maria, had been a founding member in 1906 of what was then called the Charity Organization <coughs> Society, and which became in 1919 the Belfast Council of Social Welfare, a body which, quote, saw its role in, uh, uh, in training and advising poor people on ways to restore their independence, working largely with independent groups such as children, widows, and older people." Unquote. In the early 1920s, Emma joined her mother on the executive committee, attending monthly policy meetings, uh, an active involvement that she would continue until the early 1960s. She served in, on subcommittees considering appropriate action for issues that she, the council identified as being of a special and growing concern in a Belfast that, although it was now the capital of the new Northern Ireland, was not only struggling to cope with the privations of the post-war economic slump, but had also endured a cycle of communal and uh, sectarian violence in the early years of the 1920s that led to over 400 deaths. In the prolonged period of economic depression between the world wars, the work of the Belfast Council of Social Welfare uh, occupied an increasing proportion of Emma's time. In 1933, she was elected um, Uh, that's at Bryson House. 
She, uh, they moved to Bryson House in 1935. In 1933, she was elected honorary secretary, a post she held until 1953. Her special interests included the provision of suitable housing, an area in which Belfast Corporation proved to be so, itself to be notoriously deficient. She was the principal force behind the establishment of what was called an aftercare committee. It was concerned, for example, in improving the prospects of women emerging from hospital, either as patients or as new mothers, who were expected to resume fully and immediately their household duties. It was entirely in keeping with this family tradition of public service, therefore, that Emma accepted the post of Commandant of the Voluntary Detachment Nurse uh, Unit at Stradmillis. She says, I rather reluctantly agreed, as I had put my name down at the beginning of the war, to serve, on if, to serve if called on. Emma's early entries in her Second World War diary uh, act as a useful guide to how the public in Northern Ireland responded to the prospect of war during the nervous summer months of 1939, and then the news in early September that uh, Britain was finally at war. The lack of preparedness of the Northern Ireland government in the years immediately before and even in the early days of the war has been well documented. Not least by Brian Barton in his quite magisterial recent publication, The Belfast Blitz, The City in the uh, War Years, published by the Ulster Historical Foundation. Barton pulls no punches when he says that, quotes, Although experts had informed Stormont ministers in early 1939 that Belfast was a likely Luftwaffe target, few steps were taken to prepare it for war, unquote. As far as protecting Belfast, he says, uh, where manufacturing industrial sites would be an obvious uh, target, Barton concludes it, quotes, the city's passive defences were equally ill-prepared. Nothing in Emma's diary entries run counter to this diagnosis of lethargic preparation by what has been described elsewhere as a part-time government. One of the issues that her diary entries highlight is the role played by radio broadcasts put out by the BBC in providing general information at a time when, inevitably, it was subjected to greater government control. It is clear that she listens intently to the wireless, as she calls it, commenting that, quotes, Churchill's voice in the wireless inspired confidence and one felt that men could follow such a leader, unquote. Likewise, George VI, whose, quote, simple but inspiring speech, with hardly a trace of his usual stammer, uh, had also been, she had found inspiring. Her diary re reflects the mounting concern and apprehension as the news came through that one by one, Western European countries succumbed to German invading forces. Emma spoke fluent German, having spent a year as a governess in uh, Germany before the First World War. <coughs> When she found the BBC broadcast, quote, disappointing, slight, um, frivolous programmes, uh, uninspired, gave one a feeling that we are fiddling while Rome, while Rome burns, quote unquote. She was therefore able to tune in on the long wave radio to broadcast from France and Germany. The sense of mounting drama is, if anything, increased by her description of listening in to speeches from Nazi Germany. She says, Sometimes we turned the wireless to Berlin or Hamburg and heard for ourselves the Nazi chiefs, Hitler, hoarse, choked with indignation, or heard him shouting, yelling his creed. One could feel that here was the vision of a madman. Goebbels too, shrieking, howling, cursing. Then back to London and the quiet, controlled, educated voice of an English, uh, of an English announcer, if anything, uh, too unemotional telling of war losses at sea, of the French gains on the Western Front, of our airmen's flights with propaganda sh uh, sheets over Germany. Emma was appointed BAD Commandant in early 1940, uh, March 1940. Until then, her diary reflects not only her own views on the early days of the war and how it compared with her experiences in 1914, but she also comments on how other people have reacted initially to the threat and then to the early impact of the war. In this regard, she echoes some of the comments made by Moya Woodside, a correspondent in Northern Ireland of what was known then as the Mass Observation Archive, which had been established shortly before the war by, war by Tom Harrison, specifically with a view of uh, noting the reactions of the public in the United Kingdom to, to events as they were happening at home and sometimes abroad. Emma's observations uh, relate generally to public morale. She says, quote, I have never heard one who thought we were going to lose the war, unquote. Her comments also th show throw some light on the circumstances of Northern Ireland, 
Conscription was not introduced, which meets with her approval. And on occasion she comments on the extent to which um, uh, rationing privations appear to be not quite as severe as they had been in Great Britain. Even when, quotes, such things as marmalade and all foreign fruit, bananas, oranges, etc. became unattainable, the standard of food, she says, remained wonderfully good. She approved of the decision not to introduce conscription. She says, we learn that Northern Ireland will not have conscription. The danger of the IRA and unwilling Catholic recruits was obviously the reason. There was a good deal of criticism, but I think it was a wise decision uh, not to introduce it. She reserves some caustic comment, on the other hand, on the dilemma of the free state during the emergency. She says, quote, we heard with great pride and later with astonishment that not only had the dominions offered their help to the mother country, but that Arabs and Jews in Palestine were vying with each other in offering their services. We felt ashamed for our countrymen era, the only ones to hold back. There is something, she said, rather despicable in the, in the Celtic culture, um, mixed with, with much that is charming and good. Uh, they nurse their wrongs. They never forget old grudges. Surely if the Boers and the war, she said, could, uh, the Boers and the Arabs, she said, could forget their grievances, the Irish man right. It was absurd to call themselves neutral and shelter behind the British flag and eat food which reached them under the protection of the British Navy. In contrast, she looked more favourably on the response uh, south of the border following the blitzes when she notes that, quote, Era had, has opened her arms to the refugee and the Dublin and Dundalk fire brigades had arrived, cheered by the crowds. Perhaps, she says, this will draw North and South closer together. And then she adds meaningfully, I wonder. The voluntary detachment unit based at Stranmillis was within walking distance of the Duffin family home at Mount Pleasant in Stranmillis, and Emma did not need to live at home in the first instance. She was not given much, if any, information about her duties prior to taking up the post. As it turned out, it was largely an administrative post, not a nursing one, superintending the VAD nurses who were in her charge, about a hundred of them, she estimated. As she comments, quotes, there was hardly anything to do, unquote, and contents herself with the observation that if it, it was because she and her colleague were such good administrators. <laughs> Much of her time is spent initially in getting to grips with the broad range of AF and ACI and other army forms, as she uh, uh, puts it, and she occasionally uh, gives vent to her frustration with military bureaucracy. She says, every difficulty was put in the way. I said bitterly later that the fighting in France in the First World War and the Second World War was nothing to the fighting that went on to get anything done in the army. Immediately on taking her up her duties at Stramillis, uh, Emma spent two weeks furthering her training at the main army base at Aldershot in Hampshire where she learned more about the administrative, even bureaucratic nature of the position and her role in charge of the nurses. She concluded that, quote, one of the chief jobs of the commandant was filling in passes for them. These passes seemed to me to be ridiculously elaborate. Her time at Aldershot appears to have been enlightening only to the extent of alerting her to the significant relaxation of conditions of service of VAD nurses compared with those under which VAD nurses had served in the First World War. Modern nurses were, she concluded, quotes, as to be expected of this generation, much more independent than we had been. On return to Belfast, her administrative tasks and struggles with army bureaucracy were resumed. She was particularly mindful of ensuring that the nurses in her care were fairly suitably provided for, though as she ruefully observed, it was extraordinary how uh, one had to struggle in the most to, for the most obvious necessities. She describes a few desultory evacuation and fire drills that were practiced at Drummondus. Emma refers to the aerial raids by Luftwaffe uh, bombers on cities in England that had begun in September 1940. But uh, it was apparent elsewhere uh, in, in Northern Ireland, uh, and particularly at government level, that there appeared to be no general concern even at such a near encounter. However, from June 1940, of course, when Germany invaded France, Belfast was now more readily within striking distance of German bombers. Quote, we had a few air raid warnings and orders and counter orders regarding them, but nothing untoward. 
Nonetheless, the city, as she remarks, quote, had been singularly free from air raid warnings until April 1941. It was all about to change dramatically. On her diary, the entry for that day is, on Tuesday, April 15th, 41, I was awakened by the sirens at 10.45. Happened to be Easter Tuesday, as you know. Um, Emma, Emma's opening, up, is her opening observation on what would turn out to be a remarkable testimony for the aftermath of, of, of a four-hour bombardment by nearly 200, um, Brian Barton estimates to be nearly 200 German bombers. The tremendous military hospital coach got few casualties, but when Emma checked up on her other area of responsibility, the Donegal Road Military Hospital, she found that the VAD nurses there had become very upset by the lorries arriving bearing dead bodies to the mortuary. It continues to remain a mystery why, given that Belfast was a recognised German target because of its industrial and shipbuilding uh, output, why it was residential areas, particularly in the north of the city, that took the full brunt of the German air aerial attack. For there is little doubt that the Blitz in Belfast on the night of the 14th and 15th of April, um, which happened to be Easter Tuesday, as I said, is the single most traumatic event in the city's long and often troubled history. More than that, in a United Kingdom context, it, it is worth remembering that close on 800 people were killed on that single night, more in any one night than in any other city outside London. It was only two days later when she undertook to travel to the top of to the top of the Old Park Road, where she was scheduled to give one of a series of first aid talks to the Women's Voluntary Service. That the full extent of the damage inflicted became apparent. Her itinerary from the city centre took her by one means or another through some of the most badly affected areas. Emma found her way quite intrepidly through the ruined streets from Royal Avenue to Carlisle Circus and past the Matter Inframorum Hospital on the Crumlin Road, quote, where many victims had been taken. Her route on foot from the city centre would quite possibly have taken her past Unity Street, the scene of a devastating direct hit on an air raid precaution post in which 12 people died, in fact killed outright. Continuing up the Crumlin Road, she describes, quote, little side streets in ruins, houses reduced to rubble, and a street shelter that had, been re that had received a direct hit. It says much about her determined nature that Emma continued on what must have been a daunting itinerary across the city and up the Crumlin Road. A few images from, uh, to uh, illustrate the point. That's Atlantic Avenue uh, off the Antrim Road uh, on the April 14th, 15th. As Old Park, Ballyclare Street, as Emma went up the Old Park Road, she would have come across this, or would have found it, as you can see, one part of it completely raised to the ground. Salisbury Avenue bus depot on the Antrim Road, where the buses are perched precariously. Belfast Telegraph Building itself, the city centre where she started her journey. She got into the city centre all right, because South Belfast had been relatively unaffected. And having got in there, she then had to uh, find her way uh, to, to the Old Park Road. It's also worth noting that uh, the, Belf the, the telegraph itself for, um, was responsible, is responsible for many of these images. The photographers in the telegraph at that time took, a, took many of the photographs uh, that were, were eventually published by Chris McGimsey in Bombs on Belfast. Uh, and there's a source for the devastation of Belfast in the war. It's, uh, it's one of the major sources. There was a course when she got to, it, she didn't say the name of the school, but I think it must have been Finiston L Public Elementary School in Old Park. She says, there was a poor, of course no point in giving the talk. In the course then of her weary way back, quotes, there were no trams, buses were so crowded there was no hope of a, of a seat. She witnessed, quotes, demolition squads and military digging frantically and met, quotes, everywhere people with uh, parcels or suitcases struggling to get away. Who could blame them, she says. Travelling on foot, as she did, she encountered <coughs> displaced and bombed out victims, including, quotes, a friendly little person who had been a VAD in the last war and who had come back to look for a friend, but found, they, but found she had gone. Undaunted, and in spite of her harrowing journey through such scenes of devastation, 
The following day, that's the third day after the Blitz, Emma returned to the northern part of the city, uh, that which had been most seriously damaged, to look in, quotes, on the nurses in Frederick Street, as I had been, she says, one of the committee in pre-war days, the nurses' home in Frederick Street off the York Road. Uh, I thought I would go there and inquire for, <coughs> for the matron. The patient she discovered had been a move to Clifton House, the old established building uh, on North Queen Street, and which somehow miraculously had escaped unscathed while everything around it, from <coughs> Carlisle Circus up the Antrim Road, had been almost completely devastated. She also went on to Sheridan Street uh, off the Lower Antrim Road, where lived two elderly spinster sisters who had been long-term Duffin family friends. For the first time, Emma allowed some sort of emotion to come into her commentary. She found, quotes, the old Addis's house was reduced to powder. The neighbours said there was a, a rumour that one had been taken out alive, but it seemed highly doubtful. Two, two poor, little, inoffensive old maids whose chief interest was the goings and comings of the society about them. They had always taken an innocent pleasure in following the careers of our friends and acquaintances. Every 12th of July, she said, every Easter, one turned up for flowers. On Easter Monday, that's only three days before, uh, on Easter Monday, uh, many had come as usual to their house, had her gossip, her flowers, had her train fare, and had departed. Such an unlikely place to die in the front line facing Hitler. Yet thousands like her had gone the same way, said Emma. Uh, 20,000 dead in Belgrade, 30,000 in Rotterdam. How, she says, can that man face death when it comes to him? Is it possible that he cannot be haunted by the cries and moans of the innocent victims in his own country and all over Europe? Was any human being, she says, ever before ever responsible for such misery? It's worthwhile, going back to Brian Barton's book, one of the appendix, one of the appendices in his book is, a, is a, as thorough a possible, as comprehensive as a possible, a list of all the people killed in Belfast uh, on the 14th and 15th of uh, Bel uh, April. It was compiled not just by Brian's research but through the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. And it's a very fitting testimony to the, the trials at the time. She also makes a, a, an insightful observation on the evacuees. She says that, quote, The usual tales were told of the incredible dirt of the people, of, of children crawling with lice, not even house train, who destroyed mattresses, stuffed clothes down WCs in order to get new ones, of women turning up with naked children who were fully clothed at the centre, and the same women and the same children turning up at another rest centre the following day, the babies once more naked. A terrible indictment of our way of life. It was observations, as you may know, such as these in towns and cities throughout the war-torn England that had created the conditions for the inquiry conducted by William Beveridge, whose report in December 1942, recommending that a more comprehensive social care system should become more of a, a government responsibility, thereby creating something of a template for what would become the welfare state society after the war. Some images of uh, North Street, uh, quite iconic, soldiers standing where the Northern Whig offices were. And then the, the clearance of the houses. And of course, as well as finding that the state of the population was seriously undernourished, um, the fact that so many houses had been destroyed, there in a sense created uh, the need for the house building at clearly didn't go on between the wars and then was carried on in a gradual way um, when peace was resumed. Uh, the title, that's just a, the family, a butler family on the way uh, to the train to where they were taken to Dublin. Um, this image is in the Austrian Museum and when I was doing a book with my former colleague Vivian Pollock some years ago. Um, about just iconic images of Belfast, we included that. And um, Vivian found that this butler, the family called Butler, most of them at that time, it was about 15 years ago, were still alive. Uh, I'm sure it's different now. The title there is a quote from John Oliver. His book, Working at Stormont, was published in 1978. Uh, Oliver was a civil servant who was commissioned to look after the 
as it were, what turned out to be a failed evacuation scheme in July 1940. Uh, he turned up with his clipboard and nobody else turned up. Uh, the families just ignored it. Uh, and those who did turn up, um, again, um, met with the disapproval of his colleagues, uh, who then wrote a little Lawrence Carl-esque ditty along the lines of, we wept like anything to see such lousy little Protestants, such nitty young RCs. Feel free to laugh at any of these jokes. <laughs> um, just the whole evacuation plans had failed. The exact thing as all this was, Emma's day spent on duty at St George's Market on the Saturday after the Blitz uh, proved to be as challenging as anything she had yet encountered. Responding to a request from her younger sister Molly, she reported for duty to what was the most spacious repository where unidentified bodies of bomb victims could be laid out, this with a view to helping their, their positive identification by families. There she uh, accompanied uh, in, in St George's Market, Emma accompanied uh, grieving relatives looking for loved ones. In the course of the, uh, of the macabre search, they had to look into coffins only generally marked young girl with dark hair or fair girl wearing a necklace. The ghastliness was, if anything, made all the greater by her finding a young girl, quote, of about seven or eight, sitting on a chair waiting for her mother. How anybody could have allowed a child to enter that hall of death, I do not know, she said. She compared her experience with her association with dead bodies in the First World War, where, quote, I had seen many dead, but they had died in hospital beds. Their eyes had been reverently closed, their hands crossed on their breasts. Death had been glossed over, made decent. Here it was grotesque, repulsive and horrible. Death, she said, should be dignified, peaceful. Hitler had made even death grotesque. All this unremitting gloom and destruction is only partially um, tempered by her slightly incongruous observation as she staggers out of St George's Market at the end of a trying day. Will I ever be able to bring myself to buy fruit and vegetables there again, she says. <laughs> the second air, major air raid on the night of Sunday the 4th of May was equally uh, damaging. This time the Luftwaffe did find their industrial target to the extent that only 199 people were killed during that raid. As she listened to the, quote, thuds of the bombs, Throughout that long, interminable night, Emma reflected somewhat resignedly on her experience of the April raid. Quote, Having seen these pathetic streets um, smashed to dust, these distorted bodies, the horror was brought home to me more, I'm glad to say, though I felt horrified. I did not feel fear. But even as she returned in the early morning light to her quarters after the second oil air raid, when the old clear was given, Emma was looking for, to a brighter future. She says, The grass was strewn with blackened red charred papers. There was a sheet from a child's essay book. On top of the page I read, quotes, The end of the world. It seemed appropriate. It was the end of the world as we knew it. And then, as if somehow recognising the value of war as an agent for accelerating social change, uh, even political change, she adds, Let us hope it is the beginning of a better one. Emma resumed her normal duties as a VAD commandant at Stranmanus Hospital, uh, returning to the daily, largely administrative routine of superintending the VAD nurses in her charge. She found that not only was the uh, Army's bureaucratic inflexibility as frustrating as it had been before, but unfortunately for her, her relationship with the recently appointed matron continued to be a source of disappointment. Matters came to a head when Emma felt that she and her VADs had been uh, misled and slighted over the arrangements that had been made for the end of year dance, perhaps the only major social uh, engagement of the year on an occasion as Emma knew from her time in the First World War, which was a focal point of the nurses' social year. After this disagreeable episode, Emma's diary promptly sort of dry up. Later in 1967, she adds a lengthy postscript to her World War II diary. She professes that she couldn't quite recollect what had, why she had stopped keeping the diary, putting it down to, quotes, being too busy, I suppose. However, the likelihood is that although things looked up when she found that the matron she so detested was transferred to Guildford, something of a calm down for her, she said, 
it was almost certainly the changes proposed by what was known as the Elliot Report affecting the status of voluntary and detachment nurses and specifically, specifically the rank of commandant as Emma's rank that betokened the beginning of the end of her World War II contribution. The report, the Elliot Report, recommended that VAD nurses be assimilated into the Auxiliary ter Territorial Service. Not only could this sort of, uh, this would take away their vol prized volunteer status, but it would make them a more integral part of the army. Um, uh, she says, uh, VAD personnel, it said, VAD personnel shall in the same manner as members of the ATS be subject to military law and be enrolled into the uh, armed forces. At present VAD personnel serving with the army are only to a limited degree subject to military law as civilians. In other words, they had a, a, the independence that they had formerly had was now being taken away from them. The report further justification of these thoroughgoing changes was hardly a worthy reflection on the value of the contribution of thousands of VAD nurses throughout both wars. The Army Council case for merger was twofold. It would enable the best use of the, as it's argued, to be made of man and woman power. Many VAD members were people of high intelligence as said, and capacity, and it was felt that their gifts uh, fitted them for something considerably better. On top of the, that, the rank of commandant, that was Emma's rank, uh, was scheduled to be disbanded entirely. Alarmed as much by the loss of the VAD charge of status as her own uh, rank being wiped out, Emma was provoked to write in June 1943, over a year after she stopped the diary, to Lady Mountbatten, the superintendent in chief of the St John Ambulance Brigade. Her principal worries related to the anomalies of incorporating the VADs in the AT Army Territorial Service. Many of the VADs, she said, have had three or four years' experience, yet, as I understand it, they are now to hold the same rank as the ATS do after six weeks, namely nursing orderlies. She also feared that for discipline and respect on the wards. She says, the patients call them by their first names, treat them with familiarity and no respect, and they share a mess with the hospital mail orderlies. In my opinion, it will inevitably lead to a lack of discipline on the wards. Her closing affirmation of loyalty cannot disguise her deep sense of disappointment. She says, needless to say, this is her letter to Lady Mountbatten, needless to say, I will loyally abide by the committee's decision and do my best to see my VADs accepted truly. I make no secret of the fact that I anticipate resentment and dismay when they learn of it. Emma subsequently was moved from Belfast to the military hospital at Bangor, and although she was able to live with her sister in Hollywood rather than tolerate the comparatively inhospitable living quarters she was offered, um, nonetheless felt uh, left her with something of a sour taste in her mouth. As her postscript notes, she says, I look back at my time in Bangor with a feeling of disgust. She had undergone the full range of wartime privations, all of which she has sh stoically shrugged off. Uh, in this context, and even though Emma herself would have, under, would have subscribed to the philosophy that there's a war on, you know, it does seem singularly inappropriate and unfair that this civilian volunteer who unusually as a young woman and then latterly as an experienced social administrator had rallied to the cause in two world wars uh, at, a, at home and abroad uh, could have been left with, such a, with a much more deserving and uh, fonder recollection of a service that was by any standards above and beyond the call of duty. Emma, uh, after the war, Emma continued to serve as Honorary Secretary of the Belfast Council of Social Welfare. Before the war, she had been the uh, main instigator of an aftercare committee uh, concerned to provide services for children and, uh, and, children, uh, and, hosp and uh, 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 mothers on their discharge from hospital. With the gradual introduction post-1948 in Northern Ireland of a statutory welfare system, she became concerned to ensure that the, the, the new structures uh, incorporated the main characteristics of the aftercare committee for which she had been responsible. She was part of a delegation to the Ministry of Home Affairs, which met on at least two occasions with senior civil servants, specifically on childcare. She was also involved in such matters as raising money in the wake of the Princess Victoria sinking disaster in 1953. Uh, although she uh, attained the age of 70, uh, it must have come as a surprise to discover that, uh, that 
it must have come as a surprise to the Belfast Council of Social Welfare to discover that she had resigned then in 1953 as Honorary Secretary after 20 years of, of service. Uh, she continued to serve in the committee until the early 1963. Her public service was also recognised not only by the warm note of appreciation in the Belfast Council of Social Welfare Minutes, but also the following year, 1954, by the award of an Honorary Master of the Arts by the Queen's University of Belfast. She was presented by the award, uh, as you can see here, by Professor E. S. Nevins, the distinguished historical geographer and ethnographer. His encomium observed, quote, that years ago the university ordered Miss Ruth Duffin, the distinguished first warden of Riddle Hall, Emma's sister. It must be rare, short of royalty, said Evans, for two sisters to become honorary graduates of the same university. But the Duffin family, he said, rather uh, ingratiatingly, was little short of royalty. In the tradition of public service, it had maintained through the generations. He continued, Miss Duffin showed a capacity for the practical application of her ideas. It was also after having seen and uh, proved the need for aftercare services, initiated the Belfast Hospital's aftercare committee. In 1937, it went on, when the council's housing scheme was launched, it was Miss Duffin who fought masculine prejudice by insisting that the houses that were being built should have convenient kitchens as well as uh, pleasing fa uh, facades. Emma Duffin's Second World War diary differs from those, as I said, uh, that she kept during the First World War in a number of respects. It was interrupted more regularly, principally because of her, the circumstances that allowed her to put pen to paper more easily uh, than she had been able to do in the First World War. Having, uh, sorry, having discontinued regular uh, entries towards the end of 1942, as I said, she only completes her diary as late as 1967 when, interestingly, she feels freer uh, than was the case uh, a generation earlier to raise issues such as pregnancy during, uh, among the nurses in her charge. Now, that the postscript about five pages is actually quite detailed and much freer uh, in discussing issues such as that that she clearly didn't even uh, mention um, at the time during the 1940s. Another major difference is that during the first, the first war, she rarely had ever questioned how it was being conducted this World War II diary, on the other hand, is altogether more opinionated, mainly arising from her greater maturity and increasing frustration with army uh, bureaucracy, and to a certain extent uh, on the position she held as VAD commandant with responsibility for up to 100 nurses. Additionally, the diary serves to record from an individual's perspective the impact of modern warfare, specifically aerial bombardment on a civil population, the extent to which the Second World War involved civilians to a previously unknown degree, and it wasn't until 1943 that military casualties exceeded civilian casualties, um, brought home in more senses than one by Emma's diary observations that sensitively and graphically as befits a book illustrator describe one of the most cataclysmic events uh, in Belfast history, and which it's nice that the public record office will continue to make the diary available to those who want to continue the researches. Thank you very much for your attention.